Hello and welcome to the video. In this video we'll be looking at the harvesting of quake yeast. I guess we have all been in a position where we have some quake in liquid form that has sat in our fridge for quite some months and you just cannot be sure around its viability. Or perhaps you have bought some liquid quake, be it farm quake or commercial, and you would like to build it up some to ensure good health and also so that you have plenty for the future for yourself and perhaps some others. If so, then this guide should be ideal for you as I will cover the processes that I use from start to finish. This is by no means the only way to do this, but it is the way that I prefer. So just recently I had a beer plan that would ideally suit Fram Garden Quake. I only had a small amount in liquid form as you can see here left, and this has been sitting in my fridge for many months. So to be sure that I would not have any issues with the fermentation and to preserve my supply of this yeast, I decided that this should be harvested and then separated into both dry and liquid forms. This process begins with a simple yeast starter. This starter does not need to be large. Let us not forget that quake is an underpitch compared to regular yeast, so a little can go a long way. I build my starters using a ratio of 10 to 1 in metric. This gives me 10 grams of spray malt per 100 milliliters of water, so 100 grams per liter. In Imperial, this is 3.52 ounces of spray malt for one quart. One US liquid quart is just over one liter, but no big deal. I boil the desired amount of water in a kettle before adding it to a pan on my stove and stirring it all together. I always add in some yeast nutrient and boil for 10 minutes ensuring that it does not boil over. I clean and sanitize my starter flask before then adding this wort into it at the end. As you can see this is then added into my sink which I fill with cold water to the wort level in the flask. I also add in ice cubes to cool this down faster. After about 5-10 minutes I check with a temperature probe to ensure that the wall is at a temperature where I can pitch my yeast. I am not particularly bothered if this is far below the desired pitch temperature as I use a heated stir plate that will heat this to the desired temperature very quickly. Once I am at a safe temperature for my yeast I then decant and then shake up the vial to make sure I capture it all before I then pitch my yeast into my starter. This was then added to my heated stir plate and very soon the desired temperature of 30 degrees C was obtained. At the start of this process the wort is still thin and a vortex can clearly be seen produced by the stir plate. A good vortex speed is great to have for better gas exchange between the head space and the starter. This will lead to better yeast growth. A little time later and here you can see that I have some crawls and on top indicating that we have fermentation. Do realise though that you will not always see this unless you are simply living by the stir plate. What you will notice though is that the vortex will slow because the liquid is becoming thicker. The only way to be sure that fermentation is over is as usual by taking a gravity reading. In general a starter will take between 18 to 36 hours before it finishes fermentation. It is fair to say with Quake that this is generally a lot faster. But as always this is dictated by yeast health. Sometime later now and you can see the vortex is back and after a gravity reading I'm happy that this is now finished. You can see from this photo that many of the solids have now dropped already. I then added the flask to my yeast fridge and waited for all the solids to drop down fully. No point rushing this, I usually leave it in the fridge until the next day. My next step is to clean and sanitize my separatory flask, also known as a separatory funnel. I use an oxy base cleaner like this leaving it for at least an hour and then I give it a good rinsing before I sanitize it. I would highly recommend investing in one of these, it makes this process super easy and very efficient. You will find that you can buy these pretty cheap online on eBay and AliExpress. I've got a couple of these that are 1 litre in capacity. Both of my existing flasks are actually glass and I've had them for a couple of years. During the filming of this I actually broke one of them. So I've ordered this new one from AliExpress that is plastic. Certainly much safer, only 30 US dollars for a 1 litre version. Going back to my flask here that's been in the fridge, things are looking good with lots of very healthy looking yeast which is the white stuff on top. This sample has not been in the fridge for long, but things are looking rather good. This has now been poured into the separatory flask with care to leave the bottom trub layer as much as possible. I will now leave this for at least 24 hours so that it can fully settle. Because of its newfound height, the only place to really put it is actually in my kegerator. 
This will be left for at least 24 hours so everything can settle completely. Some more than 24 hours later and you can see that this has dropped out nicely from my last photo and here is the yeast revealed. It is certainly looking very good, no real dark area at the bottom. I should mention though that a small amount of trub is not a bad thing as it provides a source of nutrients for the yeast in small amounts. Let us do a flashback now and remind ourselves that this amount of yeast came from this very small amount in this vial. Perhaps this highlights why those that use a starter with those isolate fig pouches have such a huge overpitch. The next step is that I use decorator's tape to connect a tube to the flask for collection. I find that you prefer to use a different method, but this works well for me in using the setup that I have. If you can find something that supports the flask that fits perfectly where you do not need tape, then all the better in the end, but it really depends on how fast the flow will be. I usually find that the yeast will come through the funnel slowly in stages, as you can see from these photos here. In this case it took about a day for it all to come through and I switched files at one point because I needed to leave it on its own for some hours. The danger here is that if you already have a fairly full test tube then when the beer element comes through it pushes the yeast out of the test tube. One of the reasons I have the spaghetti jar is that even if this happens then I have no wasted yeast as this jar is clean and sanitary. Here are the end results from this small starter. If you have a larger heated stir plate then you could harvest much more. But this is perfectly adequate for my needs seeing as it is simply one of the various quick types that I use. And each brew that I do I collect more yeast back than I've put in by simply top cropping. The next stage is to use a sieve like this one with a very fine mesh. Nothing specialist at all, I got this one in a local kitchen store. You will need to clean and sanitise this of course and then you can pour your yeast directly onto the top to remove as much water as possible. The safest and easiest way to do this is to decant as much water as possible and then remove as much yeast as you can from the container. You will not get it all out, whatever remains can be used as liquid yeast for the next brew and you can save the dry form for when you actually need it later on. I then leave this yeast on the sieve for between 3 to 5 hours so that the water element can drain off. During this time I put this into a storage box with a lid to ensure that this cannot be tampered with by cats, insects and the like. For the actual drying process I prefer using a fruit dehydrator. This has layers of racks and I put pieces of greaseproof paper on the top and the second layer. This is to make sure that all that is dried can be collected. Do make sure this paper is clean and sanitary. I miss the paper with star sand and then switch the unit on to dry it. I much prefer this method to natural drying or oven drying because it is fast and easy with no risk of burning if you are careful with it. I ensure that the yeast is added to the paper in very thin layers to make the drying process faster. I use this mini spatula tool, which I find to be absolutely ideal for this purpose. This was purchased from a normal kitchen store. It is of course vital to make sure that this is completely clean and sanitary before you actually put it into contact with the yeast. Once you've got all of the yeast onto the paper then you can really start working at it and getting it to even out and thin out even further. Once you are done then it is ready for the drying. I tend to leave this food dehydrator on for 10 minutes at a time and then switch it off till it cools and then repeat this usually two more times until the yeast is looking bone dry. If I was to simply leave it on for 30 minutes or even for 15 minutes then I would risk burning. Sadly mine has no temperature control which is fairly common but perhaps you will be able to find one that has. As you can see here it will start to lift from the paper once the drying is almost complete. Once I see that it is visibly dry then I tend to leave it for a day or two in a warm room to finish it off. In the end you will know that it is dry as it was easily crumbled down rather than simply bending. So here is our small dry sample ready for the next stage. I'm now going to remove this yeast from the paper onto a new piece without a hole in it. This new paper is now folded up around the yeast so that the yeast is nicely contained while I put a little pressure onto it to reduce it down into smaller pieces to make it easier to store. No need to use any real strength in doing this. As you can see now the yeast is in much more manageable pieces. In terms of storage I quite like these small vials with stoppers. Also racks like these are very handy and all of this can be bought from places like AliExpress and eBay. Just make sure the vials are food safe and all will be fine.
Please do note the light colour of the end yeast. This is how it should look, rather like commercial dry yeast in colour. If yours turns out black or dark, then this simply means that you have burnt it, and its viability could be compromised. We have all done it of course, but it is something to be aware of and correct. And finally, another topic that I get fairly regular questions on is the freezing of quake. I have to say that personally I do not see a need for this myself. My liquid quake will last up to one year in the fridge, and can always be revitalised if need be by doing a starter. Furthermore, I like to have dry quake stored, and this will last for simply years if it's stored at the right temperature in the right environment. I also top crop the majority of my brews to ensure a continuous flow of quake. If your situation is different, then as I understand it, it is much better to dry your quake first, and then place it in the freezer. But I have to say that I have never done this. If you have and have information to share, then please do so in the comments section of this video. I would also be very interested in hearing from others about the practices they have found that work best for them when it comes to the harvesting of quake. Further conversations about this and other beer related topics can also be enjoyed at this channel's Facebook group. If you have not joined yet, then feel welcome, as long as you can be mature and friendly. Beginners and experts are welcome alike. This now brings this video to a close. If you have any questions, then please let me know via YouTube or Facebook. I do hope that you found this video to be useful, interesting and enjoyable. If appropriate, then please like this video on YouTube, and if you've not done so already, then please subscribe. I regularly post new content. Happy brewing!